Breathe on us, breathe on us, breathe. 
I met a man named Jesus. And everything that the devil tried, God made it fail. You ought to praise him. You ought to testify. God made it fail, God made it fail, everything that the devil tried, God made it fail, God made it fail, 
made it fair. Come on, sing it real loud. Everything that the devil tried, God made it fair. My God. God made it fair. God made it fair. One last time. Everything that the devil tried, God made it fair. Hey. Clap your hands, all you people, and shout. If you're a guest here tonight, you don't understand why everyone is acting like they are. Maybe you don't get it. Why are they acting so crazy? If you knew what God had done for some of us, where God found us, what God has brought us through, you'd understand why the psalmist David wrote, made a, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's just something about remembering where God found you. It will do something. It'll ignite your praise. You won't be able to watch everybody else. You got to get involved. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Forgive me for making this analogy to start with, but, but I have, I have uh, occasionally been to large sporting arenas, and I've sat in a crowd of people and watched the players on the field. There's security that lines the ball field. There are people that are telling you, you need to sit in this section. That's what your tickets are allotted for. You can't go down to the specialty seating. And, and they're watching the players and they're guarding. They're guards that are walking up and down with the football players. And, the, and, and whatever, whatever uh, security is needed, it's provided. And the purpose is to keep people in their place. But I've watched those same coliseums filled with so much security. At, the, at the, the last moment of the championship game, when the goal is scored and suddenly there is an eruption in the stands and no security can keep the people in their seat, but there's an explosion. People just start running on the field. And the reason is when they get so excited about a win, when they get so excited about victory, you just can't keep people in their seat. And that's kind of how we feel here today. God has been so good to me. I can't just sit and watch. God! Somebody ought to come out of your seat right now and just give God the praise he's worthy of. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars that thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. 
Thou madest him to have dominion over all the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with a timbling heart. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Somebody say, the Lord is good. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Therefore, with joy ye shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to praise him tonight simply because of who he is. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all the saints. Psalmist David was saying, when you praise God, the spirits and the afflictors that are coming in your life, the tormentors that have been tormenting you all week long, they in turn get tormented. Come on, how many are tired of the devil giving you a hard, hard time? How'd you like to turn the tables and give him a bad time? Let's just turn it around for a little bit. God is so good. I love what I feel here tonight. There's nothing like the presence of God. We don't apologize for being Pentecostal, for worshiping, amen. Every, we don't always act this way, but we should. Amen, amen. Look at somebody beside you and tell them, if you knew where God found me, you'd understand why I act this way. Whew. God is so good. Turn around to three people, give them a high five in Jesus' name and say, God has been good to us. Hallelujah, I'm thankful for the blessings of God. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We would sing another one, but we want to have service. We don't want to, amen. I know it would just turn into an all-night prayer meeting if we kept singing, but uh, amen. Why don't we all stand together? Such an honor to have Dr. Brayton Anderson here with us. He is an evangelist. Um, and uh, travels full-time across the country preaching the gospel and I appreciate his ministry I'm looking forward to it I've seen it admired it from afar and I know that he is going to bless our congregation today would you put your hands together and welcome Dr. Anderson God bless amen praise the Lord amen I feel the Holy Ghost tonight I'm so excited about the move of God in our midst Amen. What a privilege and honor to be here, to be with uh, Pastor and Sister McKee. Amen. I love and appreciate them. Amen. I can't say how I would rank them, uh, but I would say that the Pentecostals of Katy and your leadership uh, would be in the top five most influential churches in our movement. And I would say that Pastor and Sister McKee are right up there in the top five most influential leaders in the apostolic movement today. And I'm so thankful for them and everything that they do and every bit of influence. Amen. You are a blessed church to have them. Amen. I wish I could detail that further, but I'd like to still preach for the other four. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn quickly to the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And I want to give tremendous honor not only to them, amen, but to Dr. Eugene Wilson, we, we know him and are a great fan of his and love his work and, and his influence. And I want to give special honor tonight to my pastor of more than 10 years, Pastor Andrew Seagraves, who is here tonight. <laughs> Amen. And uh, if at any point he waves me down, the service is done right at that moment. Amen. But we love them. And when he's here and his wife is here, and so many from back in Seattle, this just starts feeling like home to me. 
Amen. At some point, it's the same Holy Ghost. It's the same people of God. It's the same move of the Spirit. Amen. I just feel good tonight. Amen. Thank you so much to the worship team. Absolutely tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. I don't know what you people drink here, but I wish I could ring you out and get but a drop of your talent. Amen. My goodness. Thank you so much. Amen. We're going to turn the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. If you are here for the very first time or maybe the second, third, fourth time, if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, you need to be baptized tonight. When you go down in the name of Jesus, God will wash away every sin that you have ever committed. Don't do it next week. Don't do it next month. Don't do it next year. Get baptized tonight. Amen? Amen. And I don't care when you do it. In fact, if you check out five minutes into the preaching, that's fine. You come on up. Tell somebody up here, I'm ready to be baptized, and we'll get you dunked in Jesus' name. Amen. Now turn to somebody next to you and say, God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost before you leave tonight. Amen. I believe every last person God wants to fill, refill, double fill, triple fill with the gift of the Holy Ghost tonight. Amen. 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 We'll read our text, and I'm going to speak to you tonight on the subject of the great end time revival. Say that with me, the great end time revival. Amen. Again, a privilege to be here. The Bible says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And the Bible says that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I believe every last person has the ability to repent, to be baptized, and for God to fill them with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That can be your story, and it can happen right here, right now. Would you put your Bibles down and lift your hands to the Lord? Jesus, we love you, and we lift you up. We bless you, and we magnify you. I pray that for the next few minutes you would anoint us both to speak and to receive let your kingdom come and your will be done in Jesus mighty name come on somebody let's give him a mighty hand clap of praise tonight thank you Jesus thank you Jesus hallelujah Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated today. Thank you for standing and thank you for worshiping. Amen. I wish I had more time to introduce myself, but yes, Dr. Braden Anderson, I have a uh, dual doctorate from the University of South Alabama. I have three master's degrees. One of them in there is a business degree. Somebody said, hey, what, what, what is all that education and what's all that about? And I, I usually just tell them, my greatest passion in life is student loans. And so I just wanted to accrue as many as I possibly could. But at the end of the day, hey, I want to tell somebody this. Before you're in school or after you're in school, those degrees mean nothing in the eyes of God. There's only two things that he sees, the sinner and the saved. Amen. So you would do well to look beyond the piece of paper and just find the cross. Amen. Amen. But it is good to meet you tonight. Thank you for letting me be with you. Amen. Like I said, I want to preach on the great end time revival. Amen. If you would allow me to give you but a short introduction and get into the preaching of the word. As I look into the social and political landscape, I would come, as I'm sure you would come, to one very quick and very resounding conclusion that there is decay in America. There is decay in moral and ethical principles. There is decay in wholesome values. There is decay in the value of a man and the value of a female. There is decay in the institution of marriage. There is decay in the value, uh, value of human life. There is decay in government. There is decay in social media. There is decay on the news media. Yet, this is not the first time in history that there has been decay. 
From the days of Noah, there was decay. From Sodom and Gomorrah, there was decay. And so it should be to us today. No surprise that history is repeating itself yet again. And I want to tell you why it happens. It happens because man is born in sin. And sin has a proclivity. It has a preference. It has a personification towards breeding decay. If you leave your sin unchecked, it will grow in you and ruin you. It seeks to demolish and devour all that is good. Sin wants your mind. It wants your heart. It wants your emotions. It wants your family. It wants your house. It wants your job. There is decay when sin creeps in. Amen. But I want to tell somebody today, as much as there is decay when you turn on the news, as much as there is decay when you look on social media, Scripture makes a delineation for the church that in our era and in our midst, there will not be decay amongst us. I want somebody to know that the church is in the grave hour that it's ever been in. I want somebody to be encouraged that the church is alive and well. I want somebody to believe that what happens out there doesn't put a damper on what happens in here. Come on somebody, we're not backing up. We're not backing down. We're not sitting quiet. The church isn't in decay. The church isn't on the defensive. Scripture makes clear that something is coming for us. The book of Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And upon the servants and the handmaidens in those days I will pour out my spirit. God has prophesied of an era that would start where the church wouldn't know decay. It wouldn't know emptiness. It wouldn't be powerless, but that God would manifest in its midst. So in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. As you may know, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one accord and in one place, and there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and the Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them the words. Now by verse 13, some said, these are drunk, but no, 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 the man of God stood up and said, no, they're not drunk, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass. Verse 33 said, being exalted by the right hand of God, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he shed forth this, which you now see and here, and in verse 36, he says, let everybody know that God made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked, convicted in their heart. And they said, what must we do? And Peter said, as we read, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Theologically, if he stopped there, we would have a problem. But verse 39, he said, the promise is to you. That's his immediate audience. To your children. That's the Israelites. And to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
You know, even just this last week, Texas has been in the news internationally. Even just this last week, the enemy wants to give you a bad report. He wants you to believe that you're coming against affliction, that he's in control. He wants somebody to feel fear and anxiety. Amen. But I want to tell you, don't you dare let the news get under your skin because I don't think that you understand the era that we're in. We are in the greatest hour of the church. We are in the midst of an exponentially growing apostolic red hot end time revival. God is doing more now than he's ever done before. There are more miracles, more being added to the church. Come on, somebody, we're in revival. There's a lot of noise out there, but let me tell you where I think we're at. I see a church that is multiplying. I see daughter works and church plants. I see a record number of ministers being credentialed. I see young people teaching Bible studies and being soul winners. I see miracles. I see people filled with the Holy Ghost. I see people baptized. We are in revival right now they say online at least they say there's over 550 million people that have received the baptism of the holy ghost and spoken in tongues how small do you feel come on i don't know about you but that doesn't feel, feel or sound real small to me that's one in 12 people in the world have received the holy ghost and spoken in tongues Daily souls are added. Daily the deaf hear again. Daily the blind are seeing. Daily the lame are walking. Come on. The dead are raised. The addicts are delivered. The bound are set free. And if you're here in this place, I believe he can do it for you. And he can do it right now. So yes, while they decay out there, we won't decay in here. Let me tell you what scripture says. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come in Matthew 24 and 14. So that tells me that we are going to successfully take the gospel to every last country of the world. <laughs> Says in Revelation 7 and 9, uh, by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign over the earth. Revelations 5 and 9 rather. And then in 7 and 9 he said after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation from all tribes and peoples and and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They are clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hand. Oh, friend, I want to tell you what's coming. The English shall praise him. The Spanish shall praise him. The Portuguese shall praise him. The Russian shall praise him. Every country, every tribe, every nation, every language we are in revival even the psalmist wrote in 22 and verse 27 all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee if you knew where we were going you wouldn't even be able to sit there and be quiet you'd hardly be able to contain yourself if you could see the souls that God is already reaching if you knew the multitude in Katy, Texas that will be baptized in Jesus' name.
name and that God is going to fill with the Holy Ghost. We've got to think bigger. American decay isn't Christian decay. The negative turn of society is actually foretold in scriptural prophecy. But in the midst of such, scripture is exclusively clear. We continue to grow. We continue to have signs, wonders, and miracles. We continue to see the Lord add to the church daily such as should be saved. What I see happening is God breeding a greater degree of hunger than we've ever seen before. I think part of why he allows this to go on is because out of the multitudes and the highways and the byways and the crack houses and the apartments and the bars are coming a people that are hurting and a people that are hungry. They've turned to the world and it didn't give them the answer. They've tried the doctor and he couldn't fix it. They've went to the psychiatrist and he couldn't offer a cure. And God is letting them get hungry for something real something authentic something powerful something life changing and we have it here in this room today I'm telling somebody what didn't work before it's going to work now I'm telling you that those that were unreachable before they're reachable now I'm telling you that for every ounce that you'll go out there a harvest will come in here this is not the hour for us to retreat or sit on the defensive we can have the greatest revival we have ever had before We have the answer to every question they have. We have the cure to every addiction they could be bound in. We still heal when the doctor can't. We still baptize what the counselor can't. We still pray through who the world can't. I'm telling you, there is power in our midst, and it is only becoming more every passing day. Let me tell you the story that the media won't tell you. You're about to go into schools and bring out a revival in your school that you never thought you could before. There are going to be buildings and bigger buildings. There's going to be more baptized and more filled with the Holy Ghost next year than there were this year. There's going to be miracles that would blow your mind. There's going to be workplaces that are converted. There's going to be vans that are full and running. I believe we are in a great end time revival I've seen some very interesting things happen over the last year or two and we've experienced something interesting happen over the last year or two part of this end time revival that really leads me to believe the hour is now is God is bringing about a massive national transition we talked about this on one of our uh, calls nationally for the evangelists. And the comment was made and everybody echoed the same sentiment. That we have never seen God move so many people at the same time. Evangelists are becoming pastors. Pastors are becoming evangelists. People from the west coast are moving to the east coast. People from the north are coming to the south. God is moving around his pieces. Why do I say that? Some of you think that you're safe being on the team and sitting in the dugout week after week. But God is going to call you up. And God is going to send you out. You don't need to wait anymore you don't need to sit back anymore it's time for somebody to get back to the field it's time for somebody to teach a bible study it's time for somebody to win a soul come on don't you sit there let god move you Man, I thought we were safe just having church as usual, outreach as usual, revival as usual, but we have got to think bigger. Amen. Somebody say story time. I, I really, I have to catch my breath. So, man, it was a, probably a couple years ago now, uh, and I love telling this story because it was so transformative for me. We got invited to, to be part of an event 
with a pastor in Indiana. And we, when we went out to be part of an event with this pastor in Indiana, we were preparing. We had made cotton candy and popcorn until the glory of the Lord descended in a smoky cloud through that sanctuary. And we took it out and we got ready for the event. And as we were getting ready for the event, that pastor looked at me and he said, Hey, bro, can I borrow your rental car? And I said, of course you can, man, but you have a car. And he said, that's all right. I need your car to mark the end of where people are going to park that come out to this event. I said, ain't no problem, man. And we hop into the car. And so he gets in there. He's got my keys. He starts the car. And he gets to driving down the field that that church owns. But uh, to my dismay, he got driving. And he kept driving. And he kept driving. And he kept driving. He drove us like 11 acres away. And I look at him. And I'm like, bro, we got to walk back now. And it's like 2 million degrees outside. I kid you not. Time came for that event, probably a half hour, cars started pouring in. By the time that that event was scheduled to begin, I looked at, at that field and the very last car that marked the end of the parking lot was my car that he had parked all the way down there. That church maybe runs 200 or 250 people, hear me. We had 1,000 first time guests here in America. Amen. This year they did it again. They had two thousand guests here in America. I am telling you that we are in the midst of a great end time revival. Why couldn't God do it here? Why couldn't God do it now? Man, and then I got involved with doing tent revivals. Man, tent revival is about the weirdest type of revival that you can have. I mean, I remember getting the call, and, and, they asked, and, the, and the pastor asked me on the phone, have you ever done a tent revival? I said, has anyone from my generation done a tent revival? I mean, is that even still a thing? And he said, well, we've never done it, and I just felt impressed to call you and give it a shot. So we went out, and we did tent revival, and it was weird. I mean, weird. Hear me. There's no special lights in tent revival. There's no special special sound man in tent revival there's a plywood uh, stage that when you jump up and down on the 30 inch studs gets to bowing and your pulpit gets to rocking there's people jumping up and down and dirt is coming up to your knees there's bugs landing on your neck as you preach tent revival's weird I said bro you sure you want me man I'm, I'm not one of these Big shot preacher guys, man, I just preach to lost people. He said, man, I, I, I want to see how many God could reach in the midst of that tent revival. God did things that blew my mind. I remember one night, I was only 10 minutes into the message of what wasn't going to be that long of a message, but certainly longer than 10 minutes. And right in the middle of the message, some crazy lady raises her hand and she says, I want to be baptized right now. And so they took her over and they baptized her but but that's not the end of the story another one followed and another one by the time we got to the altar call they already baptized 11 people in Jesus name we're at Tennessee we were in Tennessee we were in a church maybe a 40 we had 80 first time guests and baptized like 16 people. I never saw a church triple in one week. We were in Kentucky. We had maybe a church of 100 or 150. We had another 100 that came in for our outreach service. We were just uh, in Arkansas a little while ago, and we saw over 200 first-time guests. We were out in Rhode Island. They put out extra chairs, and God brought some like 50 guests and 25 kids. What am I saying? I don't care what city you're in what state you're in I don't care what your building looks like or how many that you have we are in revival that's the macro level let me bring it to where you live I one guy was on outreach with our church and as I came around the corner, the youth were hanging door hangers. And this guy pulled up in his pickup truck. And I imagine he looked busy or scary or something. And they kind of selectively skipped him. 
But I'm always at the back of the group because I have like 400 children that are chasing dogs and stuff. So I'm coming back and I'm cleaning up and they missed truck guys. So I went and I knocked on the window of the truck and he began to tell me through his window. He said, my dad was a Pentecostal preacher and I was never really engaged with church, but I went with him and he died last month and now I've got no church. I've been thinking about getting right with God and finding a church. And then you knocked on the window of my truck and he said, bro, I'll be there. I need a church and I want it to be the real thing. You don't know how many people in this city right now are hungry and they're waiting and they're praying and they're ready. Man, I love this one. I was, we were on outreach in another city and a guy from the church told me, he's like, bro, he, he said the last couple nights, he's like, you have no idea how nervous I was to come out on outreach. I'm like, bro, the last two nights we did door hangers. You didn't have to talk to nobody. It was, it was like hang and run, bro. And he's like, I know, but it still took everything. And he said, and now you're telling me I got to talk to people on Saturday. I'm like, man, just be cool. You've been talking to me this whole time. And so we go walking around the corner. We see this lady sitting out on her porch, and she's eating her breakfast, some kind of nasty in a bowl. I have no idea what it was. But uh, I pulled up to her right, and we talked to her. I said, hey, how's it going? We get talking. Turns out she's from Liberia. I couldn't find Find that on a map if you paid me. But uh, she said, I'm from Liberia and I moved to the United States. I said, well, tell me about what kind of church background you have. And she said, I, well, I've always been Episcopal. And I said, well, do you go to an Episcopal church? And she said, no, they don't have rides out here, so I don't go to church. And I said, well, that's the van. We got rides. And she paused and looked at me and said, well, I could be Pentecostal. I'm telling you. <laughs> That little Liberian lady who I love because she was shorter than me, she was sitting on the front row on Sunday. She was the first to get the Holy Ghost and the first to get baptized in Jesus' name. Hear me, nobody else is going to go to this city like we're going to go to this city. Nobody else is going to love on them like we will. Nobody else wants to see them baptized like we do. Nobody wants to see them filled like we do. Oh, yeah, they'll be Pentecostal. The Catholics will be Pentecostal. The Baptists will be Pentecostal. Friend, if we go, God will go. One place we went, we went to the park, and this just so impressed me. The city had over a million people that we were trying to outreach to and via various means. One guy in the park, as we went to the park outreach at the end, one guy had gotten a mailer, he had gotten a door hanger, and he had unfortunately seen my face inundate his Facebook. Three times that poor sucker had us knocking on his door or his virtual door. But then one of our group uh, members from the outreach walked up to him. And this is what he said. He said, three times I got an invitation. But now with the fourth, I know that God wants me there and I will be there. <laughs> we ought to be there in their mailboxes, on their doors, on their Facebook we ought to talk to him at work, at school, at the gas station, at the grocery store. Why? Because in this hour, unlike any hour before, I am telling you they're hungry. And I'm telling you this works. I'm telling you there's people you will never have imagined are getting ready to sit beside you on these pews. And they will receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So we were... I was in a, a church in, in Arkansas, and I made a joke, kind of joke. But I said, uh, as I was quickly preaching, I said, you know why we don't have more doctors in church? Nobody invites their doctors to church. I said, y'all should invite your doctors to church. I, I was kind of kidding, kind of serious. But on Sunday, when I came to preach, there was a doctor there. And then I heard the story. 
So the doc came up to me and he said, bro, I have to tell you, you must have said something about me because I had three of my patients schedule with me and they had no medical problems. They just wanted to invite me to church. And so I'm here. And he came and he enjoyed the service. After I went up to him, I said, bro, man, I know a little bit about the clinic world. And uh, he owned his own uh, clinic, and I said, let me uh, set up a time. I'd love to come by and see you and see the clinic and chat with him. I went to his office as they closed, and I sat there with him for two and a half hours, the end of which I'm crying, and he's crying, and we're praying. Friend, I'm telling you it works. I have brought bosses to church. I brought doctors to church. I brought medical students to church. I don't know what your industry is or what your network is, but I am telling you there is hunger, there is fire, there is passion, and if you'll invite them, God will bring them. Man, we were, we baptized like 16 people in the jail a couple uh, weeks ago, and I was dropping off their certificates, and even the first house that I went to just began to spill out people. One, a tiny house, but man, they must have had like 50 people living in it, and they began to pour out onto the porch, and we just said, hey, we're dropping off the certificate for so-and-so that was baptized in the jail, and as I'm there, I'm saying, and what do you want God to do in your life, and before you know it, one after another after another, all committed to be in church the next Sunday. I I just want to have revival. I want to see every man, woman, and child in the house of God. I want to see our churches filled to overflowing and then bigger buildings and more buildings. I want to see the young people get the Holy Ghost and the old people get the Holy Ghost. I want to see the poor and the rich. I want to see the English and the Spanish. I want everybody to have what we have. And it's not just the numbers, but the manifold presence of God is getting heavier every single service. Again, I don't know if you could appreciate what we have already felt in this place today, but this is nothing common. This is no, come on, this is nothing routine. This isn't ritual. This isn't hype. This isn't us hitting the right notes at the right beat, but Jesus is in our midst. We were doing outreach in Florida just two weeks ago, and I got connected on outreach with a, a, a gentleman who's deaf, and he's blind in one eye, and he's mute. And he asked, he reached out to me, and he asked if we had a, a deaf ministry at the church. I asked the pastor, he said, we sure do. I said, we sure do. And so he was there sitting on the front row. It just blew my mind that that guy, unfortunately, was getting the whole service through only one eye, through a sign language interpreter sitting in front of him. But yet, though he got it through only one eye, I want to tell somebody, he stood up and was baptized in that service. And hear me, hear me, by the time he made it home that night, he had been deaf since birth, but God opened his ears and and he could hear clearly. I'm telling you of a mighty end time revival. I'm telling you of a God that is alive and well. I'm telling you he's doing it and he'll do it now. I'm telling you he's in our midst. Our trajectory is upward. Our God is doing bigger and he's doing more. We ought to plan for bigger. We ought to believe for bigger. And we ought to have the faith for right now. Right now. Hallelujah. And I sit through a good portion of the day and just imagine the great things that God is going to do in this end time. And I know they are going to go beyond even what I could conceptualize. I fell in love with doing tent revivals, and so I bought a tent that sits about 250 people, but I just couldn't get this number out of my mind that in a tent revival, God is going to win a 1,000 souls. And so I called the tent company back, and I said, I need the biggest tent that you can make. I don't care what it costs, but I bought a tent that seats 1,300 people, and I'm believing 
there will be a thousand soul revival in it. But let me ask just this. In one of the greatest churches on the face of the earth in Katy, Texas, with some of the best music that you can ever hear through your human ears during your human experience, with lights and a beautiful building and more to come, why couldn't God do it here? I'm not talking about by the fives or by the tens. I'm saying why couldn't God double a church in a year? Why couldn't we see thousands of guests, hundreds baptized, thousands filled with the Holy Ghost? If you stand together with me, I mean, Joel and the musicians, if you'd come, I mean, Joel... Chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, which is a little earlier than we read. In Haggai 2 and 9, there's all this phrasing about the latter rain being better and bigger than the former rain. You know, I, and, and as, as we had a wedding uh, on Saturday, you know, there was a scripture that uh, Dr. Wilson brought up about the first miracle of Jesus. How many remember the first miracle of Jesus? Somebody say weird miracle. Weird miracle, right? Jesus is at a wedding. And at the wedding, they're serving wine to the guests. And all of a sudden, they run out of wine. Now, the norm would be that they would bring out the bottom of the barrel stuff to everybody that's drunk and won't really notice. But for some reason, Jesus gets looped into the equation. And he says, all I need are some vessels. Bring me vessels full of water. And when they bring him the water pots, all of a sudden he changes them into wine. And when it gets served back out in John chapter 2 in verse 10, this was the response from the people. They said, every man at the beginning sets forth good wine. And when you've well drunk, then that which is worse but you have kept the good wine until now amen I just had a revelation that Jesus's first miracle is gonna look a lot like Jesus's last miracle I'm telling you that in the world of revival Jesus has saved the best for last I'm telling you what you didn't think God can do, he can and he will right now. I'm telling you multitudes, oh, miracles and revival. Jesus saves the best for last. He set a premise that when the world gives up, when expectations aren't met, that's when he's coming. That's when he's going to move. That's when he's going to fill. That's when he's going to heal. Come on, how many times in the word of God, when they heard nobody else could fix it, nobody else could do it, was that the moment that Jesus came in? So hear me, Katy, Texas. When you don't think it's possible, when you've given up, when you've stagnated, Jesus has saved the best for last. Amen. I want to invite you to step out of where you're seated, seated today. Amen. Turn to somebody next to you and say, I want you to come up front with me. Amen. Bring somebody up with you. Amen. If you're here for the first time, please come. If you're here for the fifth time, hundredth time, please come. Amen. I need everybody to come. Amen. If you're young, if you're older, please come, come, come. I believe there's about to be revival in this place. I believe the move of the Holy Ghost is about to fall in this house right now. Come on. Would you come? Would you come? Amen. As they're coming, as they're coming, I want to say again, if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, today's the day. Today's the day. Amen. Pastor McKee and the pastoral staff will make sure you don't leave with the same record of wrongs that you came with. We're going to get you baptized and God is going to forgive every sin that you've ever committed. Don't you leave without getting dunked in Jesus' name. 
We got robes you can wear, your clothes won't even get wet. We got towels in the works, but you've got to be a part of what God is doing in this mighty end time revival. Amen. We got a few that are still coming. I want you to press forward if you would. Press forward if you would. Now, church, I need you to help me. Amen. Every person in this church, amen, if you have been filled with the Spirit, amen, you're a worshiper, you know how to pray, I'm about to need your help right now. Now hear me, all around this place, we come into the house of God with different situations, with different needs. Some of you need healing. Some of you need to receive the Holy Ghost. And I have faith, and I feel the faith of God in this house that He is about to do it right now. I have faith that somebody is about to be healed right now. I have faith that somebody is about to receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues right now. Amen. If you would, amen. If you've received the Holy Ghost and spoken in tongues before, I want you to raise your hand. If you've spoken in tongues, amen. Look around the room. Look around the room. If you haven't, look around the room. I want you to see this. Everybody about in here, the vast majority, have been filled with the Holy Ghost and spoken in tongues before. You can put your hands down. If you didn't raise your hands, I believe right now you're about to receive the Spirit and you are about to speak in tongues. Again, you don't have to wait. This isn't next week. This isn't next month. There is such a power and move of God in this house right now that if you will but open the door, then God will come in and from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, the Spirit of God is going to fill you and out of you will emerge worship in a new language it's gonna happen right now now hear me no matter what you need whether it be healing whether it be deliverance from addiction whether it be the Holy Ghost, I want you to lift your hands and begin to worship Him and believe that God can answer you right now. Come on, come on, come on. I just want to set the stage with worship. Amen. Lord, we love you. We lift you up and we bless you today. Right now, I believe that you're in this room and you're moving in our midst. You see my illness. You see my need. You see my addiction. You see my emptiness. You you see my bondage, my anxieties, my fears. And right now, by the power of the name of Jesus, I am asking you to move for me. I'm asking you to fill me. I'm asking you to change. Come on, somebody. just quickly amen let me stop you just quickly put your hands down for one minute I'm, I'm not getting in the way of the spirit I'm gonna give you one piece of direction if you need healing in your body I want you to lift your hands nice and high so we can see who you are church I need you to gather around these that have their hands up come on keep your hands up church I need you to gather around could you come on if you're standing by somebody that needs healing could you gather around come on that's it that's it keep your hands up keep your hands up All right, we're going to pray for healing, and then we're going to pray for the Holy Ghost. Let's pray for these that need healing right now. Amen. I want you to hear me. Scripture says that the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It said these signs shall follow them that believe. Come on, somebody. Right now, by the power of the name of Jesus, I command healing into every body from the top of every head to the bottom of every foot by the power of the name of Jesus let it be done now 
you lay hands on somebody? Come on. That's it. Right now, cancer must go. Right now. I pray that you deliver from pain. I pray that you deliver addiction. I pray that you would heal. He's here, he's here, he's here. church amen if you're standing by somebody that you don't recognize I want you to ask them right now say have you ever spoken in tongues ask somebody next to you right now come on get in their ear and ask them have you ever spoken in tongues ask them amen if they said no I want you to tell him God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost right now. Come on. Come on. If you've never spoken in tongues, God wants to fill you now. 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 He's here already. If you will lift your hands and lift your voice, it is done. Come on. From the front to the back, from the left to the right, every hand lifted, every voice lifted right now by the power of the name of Jesus. Receive ye the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Come on, lift 
want you to come all the way to the front, all the way to the front, and we're going to pray for you one more time. And I believe as Pastor McKee lays his hands on you, that God is going to do the miraculous in your life. Amen. If you haven't got your miracle yet, I want you to come all the way to the front. Amen. As we're doing that, I asked permission. He said it was okay. Amen. Brother Stockwell is here, who's uh, uh, an interdenominal minister and evangelist. And I asked him if it would be okay if we prayed for him as a church. Amen. Is there somebody that can gather around this brother? And could we pray that God would fill him like never before? That he would experience more of the Holy Ghost than he ever has before? Come on, somebody, right now. If you need a miracle, come up. Amen. Right now, by the power of the name of Jesus, over every mind, every body, every situation, every circumstance, by the power of the name which is above every name, Jesus, let your kingdom come and your will be done. Yes, fill with the Holy Ghost, baptize in the Spirit, heal right now. Oh, come on, somebody shout.
praise God. Thank the Lord God just filled Olivia, Livy, with the baptism of the Holy Ghost very first time. God. God also filled Addison with the baptism of the Holy Ghost very first time. Anybody else receive the Holy Ghost for the very first time?